That's interesting. Um, so the next thing objection I wanted to talk with you about is this idea of modal collapse. I think mm -hmm. this is kind of like the most common thing that's kind of brought up in this like whole divine simplicity debate. So you could kind of run through like, there's obviously like different formulations of mm -hmm. like, like a general argument about modal collapse and um, why that's a serious problem for classical theism. Yeah. So let me say what a modal collapse is first and then get into the sort of arguments here. So like a modal collapse is when our modal categories of like necessity and contingency get collapsed into just like one category. And so what I've, yeah, it's like you mentioned, like I've developed several different arguments that can lead to a modal collapse where like everything is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if everything's absolutely necessary, then no one has free will, like not even God. And so that's I usually, yeah, it's, it's typically seen as a yeah. problem. So there's been a lot of weird and interesting responses to this. So I'll just note two kind of responses to this argument to kind of get people thinking about the, about this. So right. the first kind of response, uh, Catherine Rogers has this recent paper where she just says, let's just embrace the modal collapse, you know, like it just mm -hmm. follows. So maybe, maybe we can figure out a way where it's not so bad. Uh, where somebody like Oliver Crisp goes, Ooh, um, I don't want that. Maybe we could kind of weaken the doctrine a little bit uh, to like avoid the modal collapse. And he weakens the doctrine and divine simplicity in a way where God does have distinct properties and God does have potential, in which case I want to go, but divine simplicity said no properties and no potential. So I don't, I don't think that's divine simplicity anymore. Mm -hmm. But the, the emphasis, what I want to make right here is that you've got two very serious scholars going, Ooh, this, this, there's something to be said about this argument. We need to deal with it. And, and, and it's not the sort of thing that you can just kind of dismiss by appealing to like apophaticism or mystery, or just kind of like some sort of false understanding of analogy. So here's the abbreviated argument. So step one, you just focus on divine freedom. So classical theism says that God is free to create or not create. God's act of creating this universe is contingent. And that's affirmed in the classical distinction between God's imminent and transitive will. So according to John Webster, God's imminent will or action is that God necessarily wills himself. And then God's so-called transitive will concerns God's contingent intentional actions of creating the universe and providentially governing it. Step two involves pointing out something called the infallibility of God's omnipotence. And so the classical tradition affirms that God's intentional actions cannot possibly fail to bring about their intended effects. So if God intentionally acts to bring about the existence of this universe, then this universe must exist. And if God intentionally decrees that this particular timeline come about, then this particular timeline must come about because God's actions and decrees, they are infallible. And so, as I mentioned before, uh, God's contingent act of creating the universe is classically said to ground like the contingency of the universe. And so the classical tradition wished to deny that God's transitive will is absolutely necessary. And here's why they say that, because if you, you know, if you have God's infallibility uh, of his power in view, well, if God's transitive will is absolutely necessary, then the universe and everything that happens in it is going to be also be absolutely necessary. So it was crucial to the classical tradition that God's transitive will be free and not absolutely necessary. Otherwise, you're going to get a modal collapse, and they didn't want that. Well, here we go. So we got two more steps in the argument. Step three involves bringing in divine simplicity. So divine simplicity says that God's transitive will or God's intentional act of creating this universe is identical to God's existence. And again, you see this in Augustine, Anselm, Bonaventure, Stephen Clark, uh, or Stephen Sharnak. Uh, Catherine Rogers, Matthew Levering, James Dozel, they all make that really explicit. And so it's like, okay, there we go. They just said it. Step four, derive a contradiction. So the classical theists said that God's transitive will is not absolutely necessary. And so again, God's transitive will concerns God's intentional act of creating and providentially governing this universe. So God's transitive will is not absolutely necessary. But divine simplicity says that God's transitive will is identical to God's existence. So anything identical to God's existence, absolutely necessary existence, must also be absolutely necessary because that's just how identity works. So if God's transitive will is identical to God's absolutely necessary existence, then God's transitive will is going to have to be absolutely necessary. And that's when you get a contradiction. You're going to have God's transitive will is not absolutely necessary because they said that earlier. And God's transitive will is absolutely necessary because that's what it follows from simplicity. So again, okay, Polly, what are you going to do? It seems like game over. Well, you can deny, uh, you're going to have to deny something in order to avoid the contradiction. If you affirm that God's transitive will is absolutely necessary and just say, we'll get rid of that whole idea of it being like, um, you know, not absolutely necessary. Let's just embracing a modal collapse. And that's why you see contemporary thinkers like Kate Rogers and Bill Valicella just say, 
yeah, just embrace the modal collapse. I, it sounds bad, but you know, what are you going to do? But hardly anybody else wants to do that. And so it seems to me that if you really want to say God's transitive will is contingent, you're going to have to be denying divine simplicity because simplicity entails that God's transitive will cannot be contingent. So it looks like the only way to remove the contradiction is either just embrace a modal collapse or just deny divine simplicity. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, so you don't think anyone could say that maybe like God um, being like pure act has the, maybe like the option of creating different worlds. Um, but like they can't like say that there's like no p potentiality in God still when they're saying that um, God could create like different possible worlds. Is it, is that kind of like the line you would follow? That's a different argument that, that I've also <laughs> developed. So this is called the potentiality argument. And so the potentiality argument says, well, look, um, God has no potential whatsoever. He's purely actual. And then be like, okay, well, it seems like he could have created a different universe. And you're like, okay, cool. Um, mm -hmm. Well, if he could have, well, that's unactualized potential in God. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like God the Son did not have to become incarnate. The Holy Spirit could have become incarnate. The Father could have become incarnate. Uh, and then this is a very standard uh, scholastic claim that any of the divine persons could have become incarnate. Well, that's unactualized potential in God that only one of them came and the other two didn't. That's unactualized potential. And so you can, what you can do any way the world could have been, any possible divine idea that does not get actualized into a creature or a universe or something of the sort, that is an unactualized potential in God. Mm -hmm. And what you see in Augustine and Aquinas and a bunch of others, they'll say, God does not do all that he could do. And you're like, okay, but he's purely actual, but he has all this unactualized potential. That's that's a contradiction again. Um, so mm -hmm. so yeah, this is I think it's a it's a separate problem, um, but it's a very serious problem. Definitely. So what do you think um, is wrong with just maybe like if someone wants to bite the bullet and say, yeah, modal collapse is true and um, God doesn't have free will and maybe even I don't have free will. Um, though somebody say like we could still have like libertarian freedom if God just creates us that way and you just had to or something along these lines. Um, but like, what's, what do you think is wrong with the idea of uh, just biting the bullet of modal collapse? Because I have a friend um, who, I don't know, classical theist, but he definitely, he believes that this world is necessary because God is perfect and da da da. da. Like, what's mm -hmm. wrong with biting, biting the bullet and just accepting modal collapse? Do you think? So one of the things is it it really does seem like things could have been just a bit different. Like I could have wore like a nice blazer instead of this jacket tonight. That could have been. That's a real possibility. But if you have a modal collapse, that's not a real possibility at all. And even me just like taking a breath and just waiting just one second longer to answer your question, that seems like a real possibility. But a modal collapse says no, that's not possible at all. The way things are is the only way they could be. And you're like, well, that's just really unintuitive. Here's a further problem though. Other than, you know, God does not have free will and we don't have free will. When you look at your standard theodicy, that's what a lot of theodicies say is that God could have prevented this particular evil, but he did not do so for some good reason. And you fill in whatever that good reason is. Well, if you have a modal collapse, there's no sense in which God could have done something else. There's no sense in which God could have prevented that evil from happening at all because on a modal collapse, this is the only way things are. This is the only way they could be. So there's no, so all your standard theodicies, they go out the window, they're gone. And uh, that doesn't seem like that, like that's, that's that great either. And then further, one of the things um, I noticed in one of uh, Kate Rogers more recent papers, she tried to sneak in a little bit of, she said, maybe there might have to be some contingency in God. And then like a, then she kind of goes right back against the, well, well, we can't say that though. We've we got to get rid of that. I'm like, you're seeing like just how counterintuitive this, like this idea is like, it can't be like, this can't be the way it is. Um, so even like you're wanting to like, you just go like the scream of our intuitions against the modal collapse. It's so loud that even you, it's like, you know, we're trying to sneak it in, even though you want to say you bite the bullet. So those are like some kind of reasons why a modal collapse is bad.